Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A shooting rampage in Colorado kills one highway patrolman and wounds several others. In South Carolina, a powerful bolt of lightning, then a man pronounced dead, comes back to life and becomes a psychic. Meet Jonathan. He impersonates celebrities to steal women's hearts and then their money. And an auto racing legend, Mickey Thompson and his wife are gunned down in the driveway of their home. Police determined it was a contract killing. But who hired the hitman? Murder, missing persons, wanted fugitives, and the paranormal. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. the mountains and deserts of western Colorado, an unexpected terrorist attack was about to begin. On May 29th, 45-year-old police officer Dale Claxton followed a stolen water truck out of the small town of Cortez, Colorado. Claxton was a relative newcomer to the force. He had been an officer for only three years. I'll lay in behind it. Send me some backup. Careful. Suddenly, the water truck pulled over. Dale never had a chance to unbutton his seatbelt, even go for the door. It was terrible. It was... In 33 years of being in this business, it's the most violent thing I've ever seen. It was an assault executed with brutal, military-like precision. Who were these people wielding AK-47s? The police had no idea, and the murder of Officer Dale Claxton was only the beginning. An APB was put out on the water truck, and the Cortez police sprang into action. But Deputy Sheriff Jason Bishop had no way of knowing the killers had already stolen another vehicle to continue their assault. I just happened to look in my rearview mirror and I see this yellow Ford pickup following me really close. That's when the shots started coming in. And I lost consciousness and fell over into the passenger seat and wrecked my patrol car. For the next five minutes, state and local police were under siege. When they came around the corner at me, it, it took me by surprise. They went off the road to go by me, and they were doing at least 60, 70. Next, the yellow pickup truck bore down on Detective Todd Martin. I was just overwhelmed with uh, automatic gunfire. My left arm it exploded. Martin was hit twice, once in the arm, once in the leg. Officer Jim Bob Wines saw him go down. I lost so much blood. If it wasn't for Jim Bob, uh, I would have died out there. Nine law enforcement vehicles had been riddled with 300 high-caliber rounds. One officer was dead. Two were hospitalized. It was as if they were fighting a military battle. They were dressed military fatigues, uh, full military gear, and uh, as if they were going to war. An hour later, the stolen pickup truck was found in a ravine 41 miles northwest of Cortez on the Colorado-Utah border. It sparked the largest manhunt in Colorado history, mobilizing 62 police agencies. 
Where we found the vehicle is some of the ruggedest country in the state of Utah. Lots of Indian ruins in it, lots of mines, some deep canyons, uh, and just lots of uh, places to hide. Police identified the suspects in the shooting as 30-year-old Alan Pylon from nearby Dove Creek and Durango residents Robert Mason and Jason McVean, both 26. All three were known to have anti-government views. Though they had no criminal records, the three men had once tried to join a militia group, but were thrown out for being too violent. They had been going to that area for the last four or five years, had done a lot of survivalist training in that area, had done a lot of backpacking, living off the land in that area. It was like them going to their backyard. A week later, they struck again. This time, they shot and wounded a deputy sheriff in Bluff, Utah. SWAT teams quickly surrounded the area. A few hours later, the body of Robert Mason was discovered, dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The reasons for these attacks are still a mystery. For the residents of Cortez, Colorado, the brutal murder of Dale Claxton is beyond tragic. This one event has taken our innocence, taken the innocence and the, the safety away from all of us. The children that I teach still go home wondering when these guys are going to be caught. And they don't feel safe. None of us feel safe. A year after the unexplained attacks, the body of Alan Pylon was discovered by a group of hunters. Just like Mason, he had died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. As to the third terrorist, Jason McVean, he seemed to have vanished into thin air. Update. There was no sign of Jason McVean until a rancher led sheriffs to a weathered skeleton and a cache of guns, ammunition, and explosives in a remote area of Utah. Dental records reveal it was Jason McVean. The manhunt was over. But the authorities still wonder what made McVean and his buddies stage these violent, lethal attacks. We will probably never know. Next, a clever con wad impersonates a race car driver to get into the hearts and pocketbooks of his victims. And later, the dramatic capture of a man suspected of multiple murders. In the high octane world of Formula One auto racing, Danger and destruction wait around every curve. It can bring fame, fortune, and the kind of adoration usually reserved for rock stars and royalty. Big time racing has spawned its own special breed of criminal. Case in point, alleged scam artist Jonathan Kern. He has reportedly made a very profitable career of impersonating a well-known Formula One race driver named Jonathan Palmer. The real Jonathan Palmer was a medical doctor before he became a world champion driver. He is all too familiar with Jonathan Kern. He had most at home wearing Versace clothes, eating caviar and smoked salmon and driving Mercedes-Benz sports cars and being escorted by gorgeous women. And as he cannot do that through genuinely earned income, he, he resorts to fraud to achieve his desired lifestyle. Oui. Oui. Kern has reportedly crisscrossed Europe, racking up bills for designer clothes, elegant restaurants, and five-star hotels, all in the name of Jonathan Palmer, all unpaid. Police say that Kern then brought his masquerade to America. Elizabeth Jezczyk met him at a hotel in Miami, Florida. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Palmer. There's a race car driver by that name, Jonathan Palmer. That's me. Elizabeth, who happened to know about car racing, had some initial doubts. <laughs> Wasn't your hair a little blonder? <laughs> it was blonder, yes, you're right. 
And I asked a few more questions, and I said, well, what did you do before you raced cars? And he said, I was a medical doctor. And I said, that's right. I knew some background. I said, who did you race for? And he told me Tyrrell, which I knew was a British team. And I thought, wow, it really is you. Here. Yeah. Proof. <laughs> Kern's passport was the clincher. So. And Elizabeth wasn't the only one impressed by Jonathan Kern. A car dealer provided Kern with a $78,000 Jaguar, free of charge. They dropped the keys at the desk and they said, this is for Mr. Palmer for his use while he's in, in America and please make sure that he gets it. And we always believed him and that just made us oh, more convinced that everything was okay. Oh, you're too sweet. No. For Elizabeth, Jonathan Kern was almost too good to be true. Don't toy with me, Jonathan. I couldn't understand intellectually why he was interested in me. I'm just a nobody. And I said to him, why are you interested in me? And he told me he just wanted a steady relationship. He didn't want the jet set life. And he convinced me over the next few days that I was what he was looking for. Still bene. Still not Elizabeth was impressed by Kern's international connections. Indeed, everyone at the hotel, from bellhops to the manager, had been totally snowed by Kern's performance. He just wove a web of intrigue around us and managed to have a very nice holiday at the hotel for five days and run up a huge bill in the restaurant and had bottles of champagne delivered to his room. And we always believed him, despite the fact that he was already having a little bit of a problem with my front desk about how he was going to pay his bill. Excuse me. David, how are you this evening? I'm fine. We have some business to In fact, he never did pay. Kern stiffed the hotel for about $3,000. Thank you for everything. Eventually, Kern charmed his way into Elizabeth's Connecticut home. She still believed he was Jonathan Palmer, still believed he had put his career on hold to spend time with her. Come on inside. A beautiful area. But Kern's Thank thoughts you. had apparently turned to money, Elizabeth's money. Elizabeth says that Kern wrote her a personal check it was drawn on a bank in Italy for 11 million lira, nearly $8,000. At the time, I was nervous about it. And the first question out of my family and friends when I told them was, did you give him any money? And I said, first I lied, and I said, oh, no, no. And then once the check cleared, I said, see, it was fine. Yes, I did give him some money. But now the check is cleared, and, and I have the money back. I've got a meeting tonight. During his stay with Elizabeth, Jonathan made frequent trips to Manhattan. He said they were business trips. As usual, he went in style. Now in a $125,000 Mercedes lent to him by a local dealer. He also carried Elizabeth's ATM card just in case of an emergency. And sure enough, Jonathan Hi. had an emergency. You're not gonna believe this, my wallet was stolen. Once again, Elizabeth put her own money at Kern's disposal. You still have my ATM card, don't you? Yeah. Elizabeth never dreamed Jonathan would use the card to drain her account of cash. I didn't really check up on him. I could have gone through his things, but I didn't. I just continued to try and believe in him. I don't want to do this anymore. Beth, you have to have patience. Eventually, Jonathan was spending more time in Manhattan than with Elizabeth. She had a complete change of heart. Look, you'll have your money on Monday. Jonathan cleared out the next day. Suspicious, Elizabeth began calling numbers from her phone bill, matching them with names Jonathan had mentioned. Do you know Jonathan Palmer? The answers came back the same. The caller was Jonathan Lake, not Jonathan Palmer. I mean, didn't he call you? I mean, I have your phone number right here. And that's when I knew this hadn't been Jonathan Palmer that was staying with me. Call me when you get in. I'll drive. Now I realized some of the numbers that I called were other women. He'd been romancing other women while he was in Manhattan. I had been taken. He hadn't been in love with me. He was just using me. I, I just felt awful. There was one final insult. Nearly a year after Elizabeth deposited the check from Kern, the bank in Italy reversed payment. The check had bounced after all. 
Police say that Kern swindled some $15,000. Elizabeth Jeschek was forced into bankruptcy. Jonathan Kern has been charged with forgery, felony criminal impersonation, and larceny. He is 5 feet 10 inches tall and 180 pounds. Though Kern is British, he is not the race car driver, Jonathan Palmer. Update. Later in London, Jonathan Kern allegedly conned a well-known fashion executive out of 10,000 British pounds. When she called the police, he'd fled once again. If you have any information about Jonathan Kern, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Where you been? It's none of your business. You know, on a previous broadcast, an angry husband confronted his estranged wife at her home. You're gonna listen to me! Geraldine George ran next door for help. Her ex, Larry George, then went on a rampage. A neighbor, Janice Morris, was shot point blank. Please stop! Geraldine could not get away. Janice's boyfriend, Ralph Swain, was shot in the back of the head. In a matter of seconds, Janice Morris and Ralph Swain had been fatally wounded. Geraldine George was left paralyzed from the waist down. For more than six years, she lived with the bitter knowledge that her husband was still at large. Update. Wilmington, Delaware. An Unsolved Mysteries viewer spotted Larry George on the banks of a local river. The police moved in. The officers recounted their dramatic meeting with Larry George for our cameras. This is where we first encountered Larry George at, right here. At this time, a brief struggle ensued right about here. We all three fell to the ground here. We got back to our feet, still struggling. And at that point, we just turned and threw Larry into the water. George attempted to flee downriver, but backup units quickly cornered him, and he surrendered without further struggle. Larry George was convicted and sentenced to death. His appeals have all failed, and he awaits execution in an Alabama prison. Next, how can a man who was struck by lightning help solve a murder case? And later, a young American tourist who was reported dead in Baja, California, mysteriously appears in tiny Mexican villages. Aiken, South Carolina. It was a blustery night with severe thunderstorms sweeping through the southeast. Daniel Brinkley and his wife Sandy were at home. Oh, I gotta call Tommy, see if you got it. I'm gonna check on dinner. Daniel was on the phone with his best friend Tom when the storm passed directly overhead. At least 180,000 volts of electricity shot through Daniel's body. A jolt so powerful, it left his shoes welded to the floor. Oh, my God! Daniel! I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't talk. I didn't know what had happened. I was on fire and burning. And then all of a sudden, I'm out of my body. I saw Sandy checking me to see if I was breathing and start to work on me and pushing on my chest and clearing my airway. Tommy heard the explosion and he was on his way over. He got there, he was a corpsman in the Navy. He wrapped me, he went to work on me. He's trying to get my heart started. He's pushing, he's breathing in my mouth. He's talking to me. For all intents and purposes, Daniel Brinkley was clinically dead. He claims that he had what is now known as a near-death experience. I start down this tunnel. I see what appears to be a form coming out of this beautiful, misty blue. Then all of a sudden, I not only felt everything I'd ever done and saw everything I'd ever done, I became every person that I had ever encountered. 
In his youth, Danyan was, by his own admission, self-centered, mean-tempered, nothing short of a bully. The pattern continued during a tour of duty in Southeast Asia. And now, Danyan was forced to confront those that he had victimized through the years. I felt the pain and the anguish and the anger and the frustration that I had caused these people. And you know, people don't realize that you judge yourself when this happens. You just judge yourself. And that's what I did. Danyan was rushed to the hospital. In the emergency room, his breathing faltered, then stopped. Minutes later, his friend Tom Hall was told Danyan was dead. They had wheeled Danny into a little dark room. I have no idea what made me go back in there. I just had to see for myself. And I just felt like that he wasn't gone. And I saw the sheet moving. I all of a sudden went from a spiritual place and world back into this place where I'm in a hospital. I'm under this sheet and I'm looking up at it. I can't move. I can't talk. I'm on fire again. Doctor, nurse. Miraculously, Daniel Brinkley returned to life nearly 28 minutes after he had been declared dead. Dr. Williams said he's in pretty bad shape. The way it looks, that the lightning went down his back, and I think it just shattered his nerve system. After a week in the hospital, Daniel was released. He was hardly able to walk or talk. His eyes were so light sensitive, he had to protect them by wearing welder's glasses at all times. And he began to experience vivid images of the future. I was partially paralyzed for seven months, but the visions and the things that had happened in this, now what we call the near-death experience, have stayed with me longer and more coherently than virtually anything that ever happened. Daniel claims that altogether he witnessed 117 future occurrences, including the election of Ronald Reagan, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the Gulf War of 1991. Daniel later told his friends about the visions, and they verified that he did indeed predict events before they happened. Daniel first made it start making his predictions as, uh, as he was convalescing. He was talking about Chernobyl. And he was talking about the food lines in Russia, about their starving. And uh, there was just a lot of predictions that, you know, that I, I didn't pay that much attention to him at the time. He'd always talked about the Gulf War and the collapse of communism and things like that. But at the time, you didn't think that much about it. But then when it came about is when you really start thinking about it. Daniel now believes that his near-death experience marked the birth of his psychic abilities. He admits that in the months just after the accident, he was simply a dazed and bewildered young man who had undergone a dramatic transformation. Why don't you just tell me about it? Talk about crazy, you being dead and all. That's just it, Tommy. I wasn't dead. I was really confused. I'd never heard of the near-death experience. And I literally was driving people nuts because I wanted somebody to tell me either it didn't happen, which I knew it did, or please explain it. I've been astounded at the number of people I've met who have had such an experience. Dr. Raymond Moody is one of the country's most prominent authorities on near-death experiences. Or perhaps someone here has had a similar experience. When I heard his account, it seemed very consistent with what I had heard from many other people. It's something that happens to quite a number of patients who get resuscitated following cardiac arrest, and therefore, for that reason, doctors need to know about this so that they can reassure the patient that they're not alone, that in fact, that this occurs fairly frequently. In an attempt to verify Danyan's psychic abilities, we asked a well-known parapsychologist, Dr. William Roll, to conduct a series of tests. Mind if I just see your hand? Danyan gave readings for eight people he had never met before. In several instances, he picked out details about the lives of these individuals. There were facts that uh, he could not have known. 
It was like you knew when to pull out, and that's recognized by your family. From the brief experiments we did this time, he's one of the more remarkable psychics uh, that I have worked with, for sure. Later, Banyan's abilities were put to the test. He was asked to consult on a brutal murder case. In Big Fork, Montana, John and Nancy Bosco had been shot to death, execution style, as they slept. The police investigation turned up absolutely no leads. Two months later, John's mother, Tony, met with Daniel Brinkley. This is a slight bill kid with black hair. This is someone who knows John. He knew the layout of this house. In the very early part of December, this little kid will be caught, and he's in a college somewhere out west. I have to say that I just shook my head and I thought to myself, ah, I made a mistake in coming down. Daniel doesn't, you know, this, this isn't going to get me anywhere. I couldn't begin to make sense out of what he was saying. But incredibly, Daniel Brinkley was correct on all counts. 18-year-old John Shadow Clark was arrested in December and later convicted. Just as Daniel predicted, Clark had lived in the murder house, had known the Boscos, and was attending college in the West. Daniel had apparently solved the case through the power of his mind. This is new to me, and sometimes it's troublesome because I pick up things that I don't want to know about, and if someone's intense around me, I'm perceiving it, but, and I try to, I'm still trying to figure out ways to turn it off, okay? And at the same time, ways to perfect it. Joseph Shadow Clark was convicted of the murders of John and Nancy Bosco. He is now in Montana State Prison, where he is serving a sentence of 150 years. Daniel Brinkley now spends much of his time volunteering at hospices and nursing homes. Doing fine. You have the flowers looking really great this morning. He believes his near-death experience left him uniquely qualified to counsel others. Next, Mickey Thompson was a legend in the high-speed world of auto racing. He and his wife Trudy were beloved by fans everywhere. Why would someone want them killed? California, a place where people love fast cars and high velocity. Mickey Thompson was a legend in the world of auto racing. Cars were Mickey's life, racing and Redesigning them made him famous and wealthy. Among his many innovations were the slingshot dragsters. His home-built Challenger was the first car to break the 400 miles per hour mark. Mickey was also a pioneer in promoting off-road racing. A good description of my dad was he was flat out all the time and, and he was pedal to the floor. And he did, uh, that's the way he spent his life. He loved to go fast, and he loved racing. I think the businesses were a way to help him continue to race. Mickey's obsession with speed drove him far, sometimes too far. A speedboat accident paralyzed him from the waist down. Doctors said that he would never walk again. With the support of his wife, Trudy, he made an incredible recovery and returned to business as usual. I'm sorry again, but we had some real Mickey's and Trudy's everything. daily routine was just about twice as frantic as anybody else. They did not work an eight-hour day. They worked at least a 16-hour day. Mickey developed an extremely profitable stadium racing venture. But this deal with business partner Richard Goodwin went sour. It ended up in a nasty lawsuit and Mickey said he had received death threats. He had called me on the phone, and he said, Sis, I'm really concerned. And I said, what's the matter, Mick? And he said, I'm afraid Goodwin's going to hurt my baby, meaning his wife, Trudy. Mickey and Trudy lived in Bradbury, California, an affluent rural community located near Los Angeles. Early one morning, the peaceful quiet was shattered 
by the sound of gunfire. The shots came from Mickey Thompson's home. At the bottom of the driveway, sheriffs found Trudy. She was dead. 57, requesting backup. A few yards away near the garage, Mickey Thompson was also found dead. You rolled up here, was all the jewelry and the body the way you found it here? Yeah, everything was all the same. When Trudy was killed, she was wearing over $70,000 worth of jewelry. She and her husband were carrying $4,000 in cash. None had been taken. Robbery was an unlikely motive. Police also learned that one of the neighbors was a witness. Well, my wife and I were asleep in bed. It was about 6 o'clock in the morning. When we heard the shots, we literally jumped straight out of the bed. And I ran over to the window to see where the shots were coming from. There was probably about 15 seconds of silence. And at that time, we heard Mickey screaming, please don't hurt my wife. Please don't hurt my wife. My belief, when Trudy got in the van and backed it out, the people that murdered him were waiting in the bush. And Mickey just didn't have a chance. He walked right into where they were. When Mickey came out through the garage, he was suddenly confronted by two armed gunmen. Uh, one of the gunmen immediately shot and immobilized Mickey, while the second gunman approached Trudy. The next thing we've heard is another series of shots and silence again. And as Mickey laid helplessly on the driveway, he was forced to watch as his second gunman shot his wife, and essentially he witnessed her execution. Uh, both gunmen then turned their attention back towards Mickey and executed him as well. After the second series of shots, I saw two black men on 10-speed bikes pedaling as fast as they could to get out of here. Several neighborhood residents also spotted the men. The two suspects were dressed in jogging suits. They were between 20 and 30 years of age and were approximately six feet tall. Police are certain that they were hired to do the killings. I want to see this person or persons brought to justice in the very, very worst way. And I'm going to do anything I can with whatever it takes. Update. After investigating the case for 13 years, police finally arrested Thompson's former business partner, Michael Goodwin, and charged him with a double murder. We do believe that Mr. Goodwin orchestrated the murders. We believe he planned the murders. And we believe that his motive was based on uh, a personal vendetta uh, along with financial gain. Goodwin's lawyer, however, says he was falsely accused. There is simply no evidence, nor has there ever been, that implicates Mike Goodwin of the murders. The, the key innuendo or motive has always been the alleged civil dispute between Mike Goodwin and Mickey Thompson. Mike negotiated a settlement with Mickey Thompson. There are third-party witnesses that confirm that. However, an eyewitness came forward and said Goodwin was seen sitting in a station wagon in the Thompson's neighborhood, spying on them with binoculars several days before the murders. Michael Goodwin pled not guilty. However, the jury didn't buy his story. At his trial, they heard that Goodwin had bragged that he would, quote, have Mickey Thompson wasted. Further, he had left the country right after the murder. Michael Goodwin was convicted and sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The police are still trying to identify and prosecute the two gunmen. A $1 million reward is being offered in this case. This is a sketch showing what the gunman might look like today. If you have any information that could help, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a missing person's case turns into a tragedy.
the Baja California Peninsula, 300 miles south of San Diego. A young American, disoriented, penniless, and obviously out of place, wandered into the Mexican village of Colonia Vicente Guerrero. He lingered for months, living on handouts, depending on the charity of strangers. For one California couple, tales of the young stranger were a ray of hope in the search for their 34-year-old son. Gordon Collins had been missing for months. I know he's alive. I can't get on with my business. I can't get on with nothing until, uh, you know, we get him home. Gordon was vacationing with his girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, and another couple near Santa Rosalia, a popular deep sea fishing port near the middle of the Baja Peninsula. Four days after they arrived, the group secured a boat at a local hotel. Gordon's friend, Wayne Schwartz, had fished off the Baja coast many times. As the group left port, a fisherman on his way in warned them a storm was brewing. Several hours later, a fierce storm would indeed hit the area. Gordon Collins and his friends never returned. The next day, a hotel employee was sent out to look for them. His search ended 28 miles northeast. Gordon's girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, and Wayne Schwartz were dead. But Gordon and Wayne's wife, Arlene Burlington, were nowhere to be found. The bodies and all the paraphernalia out of the boat was all within one square mile of each other. Because I talked to the fellow that fished the bodies out. And, uh, and so and we say, well, hey, where's the other two jackets? Where's the other two people? For three days, the United States Coast Guard searched the 250-mile area. Nothing. It seemed obvious that Gordon and Arlene had also perished. In time, Gordon and Arlene's parents were asked to sign death certificates. However, reports that Gordon was still alive had already begun to filter across the border. Some thought that he might be suffering from amnesia. His parents went south to Mexico to find out. Raul. We've got flyers made up, and two Mexican fishermen come running up to us and kept pointing to the flyer. He said they seen a guy come out of the water, he just had shorts, and he was all cut up, waiting there, at the, trying to get on a bus station. I was very excited. The thing started fitting together, because this is where the accident happened. Uh, they found the bodies uh, just a mile and a half off of this shore. It's got to be Gordy. Around the same time, Gordon was also spotted on a nearby beach by a man named Jose Peralta. You have your blanket? Okay. You have your blanket? I I'm cold. Jose said that Gordy said he was waiting for friends he went fishing with. And could he have Jose's blanket because he was going to sleep on the beach there at Cabo and wait for his friends? Okay. On one trip, we're headed toward La Paz, and we stopped at a few of these taco places. And they says, yeah, I've seen him an hour ago. So we went on down further, probably another three or four miles, and we stopped again. And the guy says, yeah, we've, we've seen him about 30 minutes ago. So we finally got right into town, and they says, yeah, within five minutes. And then they seen us all, seen us together, and I don't know what happened, but everybody just clammed up. We couldn't get no... We couldn't get no, uh, no more information. Over the next three months, Gordon Collins was spotted at least 50 times in seven different locations, all in the area of La Paz and Cabo San Lucas at the southern end of the Baja Peninsula. 
Gordon's parents hired Bill Garcia, a private investigator who alerted newspapers in Baja. After the articles ran, Garcia received several calls from a village 300 miles south of Tijuana. He was four or five months here in town. He never worked here, never worked. And he only hang around here in town. He was walking all the time. And almost in the town, everybody knows him. We've shown them pictures and everyone recognizes him. And they're positive that it's him. The people that have talked to him know some things about Gordon and feel confident that he is there. The man identified as Gordon was eventually arrested for stealing food. A local sheriff brought in James Hatfield, an American living in the village, to translate. My name is James. What's yours? Hi, I'm, I'm Gordy. There's no doubt in my mind it's Gordon, because when we met him in jail, I introduced myself to him, and he gave me his name, Gordy. And then when the flyer came out, it's right there on the flyer, Gordon. And you can't get the two pictures mixed up. It's the same. He moved on shortly before we were able to get to that area, and we haven't been able to find where he's gone from there. Over the next year, sporadic sightings of Gordon continued. The U.S. consulate has officially reversed its position and no longer presumes that Gordon Collins is dead. You just can't up and give up because it's your son. I know it keeps me driving, it keeps me going, and I want to get him home. Gordon Collins is six feet two inches tall and has light hair and blue eyes. Based on eyewitness descriptions, a police artist made this sketch of the man thought to be Gordon Collins. If you have any information that might help find him, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. <laughs>